Chapter 4 Anticipating Competitive and Cooperative Dynamics So far in the first three chapters we know how to build for strong competitive position but now that you have built as a company as a team a very competitive position how do you ensure that you stay competitive how do you check for you know competition outside that is about to disrupt you and what are the ways in which you could be disrupted so that's the thesis of this chapter so in a sense how how do we anticipate um, interactions among independent players that will evolve over time especially those that are our competitors these are independent players our competitors are busy at work trying to eat into our added value and there are certain cooperators also out there who are willing to cooperate with us if we can extend the pie so how do we how do we anticipate these interactions because they could eat into our competitive position so there are two possibilities number one if there are small number of identifiable players taking decisions based on economic incentives so if you know that there are only few competition competitive uh, companies out there trying to compete with you if there are small number of these competitive players then you can use game theory if you know that they're going to use um, rational decision making based on optimizing for the highest economic outcome or you could use behavioral theory where you know that there is a high chance that this company is not going to act rationally and this only works if you have identifiable small number of competitive companies the second option is when you have large number of potentially unidentifiable faceless competitive players so in these two the approaches are very different when you have small ones you use game theory or behavior theory to identify the strategic moves but when you have large ones and those that you're not even identified then you have to check for different ways of how they will compete with you the first one is there's a threat to realized value the value that you already added as a company they could either imitate you or they could try to substitute you completely with a new business model or there's a second threat which is a threat internally within your company where there's lots of hold up because of various processes that are set up by lots of people and there's lots of built in slack so when there are unidentifiable faceless players then you can focus on these four areas imitation substitution threats hold up and slack threats so now let's get into each of these four things we're going to go through game theory behavioral theory imitation substitution hold up and slack and now we know where each of these four fit in so game theory is uh, when players are identifiable actions are mappable to payoffs so before i go into this details let me take uh, an example let's say there is this uh, company your client's company uh, which is on the left hand side which is the client's price and let's say the entrance price so let's say you are representing the client and there is a competition an entrant e which is trying to compete with you so what do you do and let's say you are in the pharmacy business pharmaceutical business you first create this payoff metrics in a sense is basically saying what are all the variants that my competition in this case the entrant e will take in terms of launching a new product on a price they could launch a new product with low price very low price low price moderate price and high price and also these are all the variations and then these are all of your responses your responses as in what your client can take as a response that your response could be i'll make no change to my price even if a competition comes in with a low very low price i'll have i let the entrant e have a large price advantage meaning there's a huge difference between my price of my pharmaceutical product and the entrant and then a small price advantage and then the last being i will neutralize meaning whatever their cost is i'm going to match that cost so there are these variants that you can have these are these variants that this identifiable player this entrant can have and then you can create this payoff metric which basically is the c's payoff the client's payoff which is how much will they get in that cell 
versus ease payoff. How much is the entrant expected to pay? So it's a C's payoff versus ease payoff. So let's take an example. So in this case, when an entrant sets a very low price, and if your response is no price change, then you are expected to make $358 million, and your entrant is expected to make $119 million. So likewise, for every combination, you can calculate for what will be your gain versus your client's entrance gain, right? So now in that case, we can do a simulation. We can run like what will happen if uh, I'm trying to simulate, uh, if I'm, I'm, I'm trying to simulate like uh, uh, what would happen, what would be my choice, right? First step, I will try to simulate if the entrant comes in with a very low price, what will I do? Then I will pick the one that is the highest here, right? If they come in with a very low price, I will pick the payoff that is highest, which is 458, which is this. If now they come up with a with a price that is low price, then I'm gonna pick I'm gonna pick 511, right? So I'm gonna pick this one. And then if they come with moderate pricing, then I'm gonna pick okay 585, 636, 585, okay 636 is highest. So I continuously do that, and then similarly, these I'm gonna then my entrant is gonna do the same. He's gonna say, hey, uh, if uh, if there is a no price change that uh, my competition or the client will make, what price should I launch at? Then it, he will check, okay, 190, 168, 129, 116. He's gonna choose 190 because that has the highest payoff. So now the entrant is trying to model what should they do if this is the situation. Similarly, the entrant will say, hey, what should I do when E has a large price distribution advantage? Then they'll pick this one because 168 is greater than 163. And so likewise, they'll keep computing all of these variations and realize, hey, I'm gonna pick this one, 155, because it's the highest if any, when they give me a small price advantage among these. And likewise, I will compute like uh, for an entrant, for a client, what is the best combination out there? And the, the yellow ones means it's non-applicable because uh, think about this, this is when you have a large price advantage, so it only uh, is applying here, and small price advantage only applies here, right? So now we found an equilibrium. An equilibrium is when you cannot determine what will this other player do, right? And in this case, it's best for you to have the entrant have a small price advantage because you will maximize your profit as, as, the, as the current client. So this simulation of putting yourself in the other shoe is game theory. And you can do this for, for like few identifiable players because as this dimensions grows, it will be very hard for you to compute all of these payoffs with the precision that you need. So now we've seen game theory, but, but overall works with identifiable small players. The focus is on economic incentives, right? Um, and it's expected that the client is rational. Uh, if, if you think that they are not rational, they'll not optimize for their economic maximum advantage, then this game theory doesn't work. So also there's assumption that this is a non-zero sum game, meaning not everyone has to lose. There's a win-win or there's a lose-lose, right? Zero sum games are games when either I win or you win. Uh, if I win, then you lose. If you win, then I lose. So these are rule based, um, rule based as in there's specific rules as to what are the payoffs, and it's very clear. Um, and there is a pop, there's a potential for equilibrium as we saw here, right? We saw that there's an equilibrium at this point. So that's game theory when you can expect your client to be rational. But what happens when you when you don't cannot expect that, right? When you cannot expect that, then there's irrational behavior that can take place for various reasons. There's biases. People might have biases based on you know what what they have perceived to be the reality, what they feel uh, works for them in the past, and they'll continue to do that. There's sunk for, sunk cost fallacy in terms of what past choices overweigh their present decisions. There could be bad information. They might not even be computing that metrics correctly. Maybe this 155 was 130, and so then they end up choosing 138. So there could be information, you know, asymmetry. And the most important, the most important in behavioral theory is culture. A lot of times companies are predispositioned 
to act and respond in certain way based on their culture. So if you know, if you know that your competition is actually predetermined and predisposed because of their culture to not be able to respond as quickly, you can certainly ignore game theory and bet on behavior theory. Because people uh, changes, capability changes, relationship changes, you know, the way they hire, the way they, how fast they move, all of that is very hard for you to change your culture. So if it, it, it's basically it's predisposition. The, the company will do certain things certain way and if you know that they are going to succumb to that predisposition, then behavioral theory will have a much higher weightage than game theory. So competition analysis in terms of like how, what your competition is doing, what, what can you do about it, what are the response profiles, what capabilities you need to build. This could be a grid that you could build based on behavioral analysis. But there are many other ways, right? Um, there are two, two key concepts that I want you to take out of this, which is mediocrity, which is regression towards the mean. When someone, when a team or a company does really great return on investment, performs really well, over a long period of time, there is a tendency, it's not certain, it's a tendency that they'll regress towards the mean, meaning they'll, they'll be mediocre over a long period of time if they not innovate. And then the second thing is red queen effect, which is it takes more dollars to stay in the game of a poor industry. So if you're in a poor industry and trying to stay competitive in that space, then more and more dollars are needed to just stay where you are, maintain your market space. So that is the key learning. Based on these two concepts, uh, Red Queen effect is, is, is pretty famous where um, it takes all the running you can do just to keep in the same place. If you wanna get somewhere else, you must run twice as fast, right? So. It's very important to, to realize which kind of business you are in, which mountain are you climbing? Is, is, is the old mountain um, already climbed to such an extent that people have now super high expectation off of you so that if you have to go farther, you have to run like twice as fast just to like stay in the game. It's very important to know which kind of industry you are in, what kind of fitness your organization has and what kind of bar you're trying to raise. And so are there like causal effects that threaten peak performance? And there are, right? So, so far we've seen like identifiable small uh, players that are competing, but now what happens when there are faceless, unidentifiable players? There are, are there like causal performance um, reasons where they can eat into your competitive position? And there are, so there are these four, imitation, substitution, hold up and slack. So they, imitation and substitution, they eat into your already added value which is the added value that you've realized. Slack and hold up eats into an appropriated value, which is basically realizable value. Meaning this is the value you could have, it's on the table, but you're not, you're not getting it. It's, 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 pos it's possible for you to claim both of these. So let's get into each four of these. Imitation is in a sense copying. When, when, a, when, a, when an imitator, uh, when a competitor imitates you, they're copying your best ideas and trying to sell it for cheap. They are trying to give a discount. And it happens between companies with similar business model. And it happens uh, when, 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 when imitation, you know, when someone imitates you and your market share decreases, it certainly indicates there's a peak. Um, and also imitation is contagious. Uh, it, uh, you will see that top players will probably have the same like uh, competition for the same set of people. They'll have the same set of features if you compare Apple and Samsung, phone features, it's very similar. So what are the barriers? What can you do to limit imitation? So you can have economics of scale and scope work for you, which is if you know there's specific some amount of demand and if you like uh, make your scale economics work, as in you can build at a much lower cost and you can now distribute many more products in the same distribution channel, then you're scaling up. And if you make your information private, your secret sauce, how guard, how much can you guard your secret sauce, then that's also a barrier for imitation. Like Apple really tries very hard to reduce the amount of um, information leak for new product launches, especially the technology for a long period of time. That gives them an edge, it gives them a huge additional advantage in terms of uh, uh, gaining that market share. So. First movers advantage, which is if you build right relationships and contracts and you, you favorable contracts because the first time you're trying to, let's say Apple's trying to launch the phone the first time and AT&T, they can really 
bargain hard with AT&T saying, this is the contract I want. You can also use network externalities to really gain big market cap, grow really quickly so that now the, the network externalities help you more. It's more harder and harder for people to, to copy you because it's, it's much more difficult. So retaliation, you could retaliate, like go in with a pretty low cost uh, that, that you just throw the competition out of the water. That's what Facebook did when Google Plus was trying to launch. Time lags, build huge time lags in, in terms of like, um, remember marketing is the only area where you can really imitate and quickly copy, but uh, product features, strategy changes, people changes, all of that takes huge time lag. So build in time lags in terms of how, what is shared, build in complexity, like make your products work so very well that uh, it's hard for people to copy like the Toyota example we saw earlier. Um, in the seven powers book. Continuous upgrading, if you constantly upgrade and you give better and better products like Apple upgrades almost every year, right? It's hard for competition to just stay in the game. So they have to like really improve with you. So imitation, copying, huge. They can add, they can take out that added value, but you could build a lot of these barriers so that imitation is harder. Substitution is, this happens between business models. like. Like let's say the hotel industry, it's gonna be substituted by Airbnb. It's a completely different business model and the hotel industry is gonna have a really, really hard time because unless they fight and make their product 10X better, like Intel did, right, for their chip. Uh, when they had an issue with performance, with R RSIC chips, which is in the chapter, so they, they made their product like 10X better, right? So if you can fight and make your products 10X better, that's the only option from being disrupted by substitution. Uh, but if not, you're better off switching yourself, like just switch, harvest, take profits, and then switch yourself. Uh, you, you don't wanna switch too quickly because then you're just losing all the cash flow advantage you had, but there's gonna be a time where you're gonna be not profitable. I'm waiting for that time when hotels would potentially be unprofitable to stay in the business. So recombining some of the best ideas that work from your competition, like take take what really works, like let's say online trading. That was new for full service, like uh, offline trading clients. So take take some of the good things and then incorporate. Straddle is when you, you try out your dominant business model and in parallel for new customers, you try out the new competition, competition's business model. That's also one way, but Remember, substitution, if it works, is a much, much, much more powerful threat in the medium to long term compared to imitation, right? Like the Airbnb. And there could be many triggers for this. The triggers could be technology innovation, policy change, and deregulation. Like if there's a huge policy change, demonetization, let's say in India, when the hard currencies were banned, it was a huge boost for online payments. So there could be these triggers um, that you would have to be very mindful for. And the most important trigger is consumer behavior. There's generations after generations, they have different patterns of consumption, different patterns of enjoyment. If you don't keep that trend in mind, you, you're gonna be disrupted through substitution. So there's only one way, either make your, make your product 10X better in, in, the, in the fight against substitution or you switch yourself by harvesting. Hold up is basically when you're when you're hold up when you're held it up by others. Like you have so many of your suppliers, your buyers, your complementers, your employees, your staff, your processes. So many of these things in in the way that could just hold you up to gaining maximum efficiency. Like for example, GE had uh, not GE G, General Motors had contracted the metal stamping parts from a company, but they were not willing to you know invest as much heavily even if they had a long-term contract. So you may be at some point being held up by your efficiencies from your downstream. So how do you improve your suppliers? Even if you are good, but you your long pole may not be you, it could be your downstreams. So understanding that strategically working with your partners is very important so that they don't held up your claimed value and they don't eat into your claimed value, right? So. The barriers for this is uh, long-term contracting. If you do short-term contracts, then the contractors don't really have an incentive to invest and build for you. So if you can build long-term contracts, if you can gain some sort of bargaining power by dual sourcing, if you have only one supplier, then they have a huge power.
to bargain with you. But if you have dual sourcing, then that, that's your advantage. Vertical integration is another big one. Like if you see that there's inefficiencies that you can bring in-house, building in-house and integrating that internally is vertical integration. Asset specificity, like if you can specify the exact level of details of what you want and your supplier builds it for you, then that's good because now you can send that same specification to some other supplier. But if you give them a black box and then they do all the magic and then they invest in the R&D, it's become very hard for you to change your suppliers. Building your relationships with all of your uh, constituent activity holders. Like, can you build relationships in such a way that they think that, they not only think that they feel that, and then and in reality, you are actually treating them fairly. That builds that relationship. Like, how can you build those relationships, sell them products that they really need, uh, cross-sell them, make it very hard for them to switch. Those are the barriers to holding up and you can, um, being holded up. So. Remember, when you are co-evoluting with, when you are in co-evolution with your suppliers, they need to raise their game as much as you need to raise your game. So it doesn't matter if you are, if you are really good, but if your suppliers and your, you know, employees or your, you know, buyers are not raising their game, then it's going to be you're going to be hold, uh, held up by them. Slack. This is when you know. Uh, uh, slack happens when there are successful teams that uh, they just need more and more right so like rich diets harden organization arteries that's a really good quote that I got from this chapter so when once you get famous and once you get successful once once the team and the companies are in a very high value then slack gets built in which is basically dissipated value like lethargy inertia so the way to gather um, and monitor this and improve on this is to have some sort of a competitive info gathering like com check how how many people you're spending versus your competitor the second competitor where are they building how much you should be doing do you monitor for the right things remember you don't want to monitor too much because you don't really want a software engineer sitting at the computer but with their eyes shut uh, but you really want them to be productive. So extreme monitoring also kills culture, but there's got to be some level of monitoring where you know that there's a problem and you can act and your team can act. So gather competition and, and data around competition, monitor behavior, incentivize people for performance, add that culture of um, operational excellence, build that norm of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, which is much much more powerful than the monetary incentive, much more powerful than the stick incentive of punishing them or performance issues. Um, that is super helpful in reducing slack. Finally, governance. Like if you have the right board of directors, if you uh, support your activist investors and you, you take care of your minority shareholders, like those are really good governance mechanisms you can put in place to make sure that there are no, there's no slack built up. And if it is, that you could actually go and fix it. And finally, fun projects that really are uh, potentially positive NPV today, net present value, not the ones that are successful and will potentially dwindle down. So fund those newer projects as aggressively as possible. And remember, you can't really do small, you know, incremental changes to gain meaningful uh, impact. So what next? We know about so many things now. Mobilize for change is, is what you can do next, right? Find out um, where are the bottlenecks? Where is the competition eating your lunch? And then build a powerful vision and change, daringly change the organizational priorities, people boundaries, and innovate. So summarizing, there are small num if there are a small number of players that you can identify that have economic incentives at work, in a, a rational way, then you can use game theory. If not, you know that they're predispositioned to make mistakes, then you can use behavioral theory. If there are a large number of unidentifiable faceless players, then there's you have to think from a causal standpoint, like what are the things that they can eat into? They can eat into your added value, which is then through imitation and substitution, or they can eat into your appropriated value, which is your realizable value, then think about hold up, where are the bottlenecks? and think about where is the slack being built. And there's potentially like steps you can take. Uh, check for competitive advantage. If you do have competitive advantage, then then it's, it's good. This is chapter three. If we don't have competitive advantage, nothing works, right? And then is there like a scarcity of uh, 
effort, resources, and others. Then think about these risk imitation and substitution. These are the biggest ones. Once you are successful, then you have to think about appropriated value and then think about hold up and slack. Uh, if there's no hold up and slack, then you're golden, right? So there are steps you can take. And this, this slide summarizes this all into one place. All of these slides are pasted in the description section of this uh, video. So these are the four threats of sustainability from a causal standpoint and how to build barriers for them, how to respond and uh, for all four, imitation, substitution, slack, and hold up. Super powerful uh, learning here. Uh, gives us a very systematic way of attacking this problem. Applying this and making changes in the organization is the most important thing and takeaway from this. Thank you.